Okay, I think we'll maybe get started. Uh, so I think you know who I am already, so I'm Lionel Jensen. Some of you I've actually met in the past, but uh, some of you I've not seen for a while also, but others I don't know at all. So anyhow, um, we're going to spend the next uh, hour or so just trying to get a sense of uh, what's really going on in China and giving you a chance to understand more about uh, what makes it such an unusual part of our world economy and how, in fact, uh, its current expansions into uh, various parts of the world by way of two different efforts, one being an effort to militarize the South East China Seas, and then secondly, to expand uh, investment and loans throughout the entire world as part of a larger uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it's called. And we'll look at some of that as we go along. Uh, I'm also going to give you, I'm going to offer some slides that show you a little bit about what daily life looks like and uh, give you a sense of what the map looks like and things like this so you get a sense of what China is all about and why it's so difficult to, um, to govern. And I think I'll begin by just offering a comment that uh, William Faulkner offered when he was um, a writer in residence at University of Virginia. He was, he was asked by a student, and, and my father had actually had Faulkner as a teacher and, uh, at University of Mississippi, and Faulkner was a pretty, um, let's put it this way, he was not an even-tempered person. And so uh, a student at Virginia asked him what it was like to write a novel, which was probably not a good question to ask him. And um, he became, apparently he became somewhat, um, I guess, and did get, but he turned red and wasn't sure what to say. And ultimately, he said, I'll tell you, it's like a, a one arm carpenter trying to build a chicken coop in a hurricane. So I think that's what it's like to rule China. It's, uh, it's that hard, right? So, uh, and you also need to understand that a lot of the statistics that we rely upon in terms of uh, China's finances, uh, especially their their debt, uh, which is far worse than they could imagine uh, or want to share with us. But more importantly, a lot of the growth statistics we've learned about China over the years, the double digit growth, was, if you will, by the government's own admission a few years ago, perhaps a bit uh, inflated. And that it is the case that perhaps China's growth was never quite as uh, dramatic as we believe, still quite significant, but uh, we should keep that in mind. So let's, uh, let's roll through this and see where... Uh, if this works from a distance, I want to see. I'm not used, when I'm in the classroom, I can't stand anywhere and just be behind a lectern. I, I can't do that. And I teach a lot of seminars now because I feel that oftentimes we don't get enough opportunity to really discuss things that we do. So I'm really in a more, I'm in a phase I used to be in when I had hundreds of students that I would lecture on Chinese thought or whatever, and, or politics. So, um, all right. So. Here's a map. We know several things about China, right? We know it's big. When I ask my students if they can tell me the one thing to know about China, they say lots of people, big country, something like that. It's one or the other. Uh, or it's uh, dangerous. That's another thing I'm often told. Uh, I don't think there's any imminent war between China and the United States other than the current trade battles they're having, which is affecting both of them rather adversely. But uh, anyway, you get a sense of how it is that um, China is surrounded by quite a number of rather problematic areas, right? You, you have Mongolia, Outer Mongolia, which is actually a democratic country. Then you have Inner Mongolia, which is not. It's part of China. And then we have all the stands, as they call them, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan. They all actually touch China. So if you think about how problematic a lot of that part of the world is, and if you think about the border it has with India, Nepal, I mean, you can see here that this is really, and as well as Burma, Laos, Thailand, you can see this is actually a very significant place for it to be. And it also borders, as you know already, from uh, the, the way in which we've been talking about the, the nuclearization of North Korea is really very much a part of the North Korean uh, politics. This shows you where the population density is of China. You can see that it actually is built largely along the, it began along the littoral or the, the coasts and then made its way in in the course of any number of years. But you can see the investment for the most part um, followed that of the uh, density of the population. Right? And I should note that this is a population which is often on the move. 
Uh, there are about 200 million, maybe a little over 200 million people who are always, if you will, moving somewhere in China. They're just simply, it's what the Chinese uh, government calls the um, the, the Rinko, uh, Leo Rinko Winti, the idea of the roving population problem. And so that means then that a lot of people you can't really keep track of. They end up moving into cities. And in fact, the government you should keep in mind is and I'm not quite sure, I, I think I know why they're doing this, but I'm not sure it's a very good idea. They're encouraging increasing numbers of people to leave the land and move to cities. So in the 1970s, about, about 700 million people may well have been on uh, either para-urban or rural residences. And now we have about, meaning something on the order of about 70%, 75% of the country was actually rural. Now it's approaching 52%. So the country is certainly moving toward greater and greater urbanization, which is causing lots of other problems. But uh, I think the government thinks they're managing the country better if they can actually have more people move into places where there's more infrastructure from the point of which they can actually uh, control. This gives you a sense of all the different provinces that uh, exist in China. And this includes Hong Kong and Macau, which are actually very separate zones. Uh, you wouldn't want to go to Hong Kong or Macau and call somebody, let's say, uh, Chinese. Uh, in those places, it's um, become very problematic to speak of someone being Chinese who's a native of Hong Kong or Macau. So this gives you an idea that China is big, but it's actually not as big as the U.S. If you add Alaska and Hawaii, it looks like the U.S. is, of course, a little bit larger in square kilometers. So it's just a superimposition just for the heck of showing you that it's not really as large as we might think it is. But nonetheless, it's even more complicated than the United States, even though it's, uh, and that has little to do with the population in some respects. This just gives you an idea of how much the country is developing. If you go back to that slide in your mind of the, the dense population on the East Coast moving to the center. This is reflected here in the fact that the East and West of China is divided along that line where there are multiple colors on the left and purple on the right. This is really where uh, the country divides up. Less and less of the country is developed as you move out toward the West. And that's not surprising. You have Tibet there, Xinjiang, Qinghai. These are areas that are really not uh, as developed as the rest of the country. So a lot of the images we have of China often neglect to present what it looks like in other parts of China, as you might expect. So uh, China is quite diverse, so I thought I would actually give you a few images of all the different kinds of people who are uh, part of China. And so the diversity is also reflected in this. These are the, uh, China has officially, officially it only has a few languages by its own admission, but it actually has about 50 distinct languages. And by that, I don't mean dialects, I mean languages. Languages, if you will, are, if you will, not mutually understandable. So you should keep in mind that China's diversity ethnically and linguistically is really quite immense. And it's also a very important reason why it's difficult sometimes to imagine how to get any communication out in some parts of those areas we just discussed, right? The, the ones that are in the West. So uh, these are all different languages that are marked here by these uh, colors. And it is the case that even in places such as um, Yunnan, which is um, right down here, or Kunming is the capital, but Kunming here in, is Yunnan. This is part of the Mandarin area. It's identified as being an area where Mandarin is spoken, but, but uh, there is a, there's a dialect of the city of Kunming but it's actually sound, it actually sounds like a language. It is, in fact, a language. There's also Yunnan Hua, which is actually a Yunnan language. So, in fact, you get these bizarre developments in which within Mandarin, there's something else happening here, which is not really quite Mandarin. And though, in fact, it's, re it's required that teachers provide at primary school to secondary school instruction in Mandarin, it is the case that the standard dialect is never effectively taught in most of these regions of the country. And the northern dialect from Beijing is what is normally supposed to be the standard, but the standard is not found that readily in the rest of the country. So it means that sometimes it's even hard to understand somebody who may well be speaking Mandarin. I'll just give you one example. In, um, if you want to ask someone where they're going in, in uh, Mandarin, you might say, uh, 
Ni dao na chu. All right, so where are you going? It's like a way of saying hi or what's going on. And in Quinming, they say kalaja. So it doesn't sound anything like it at all. It's not even close to it, right? But it, in fact, would be the same uh, characters, right? So are the same sinographs as we call them. So something about the complications there. All right, here's about the economy and society of China. Gives you an idea of what this is from a couple of years ago. Give you a sense of uh, the, the sort of breakdown of assets and the breakdown of、uh, percentage of ownership of、uh, property, etc. But of course, I should indicate, as you probably know, no one can actually own private property in China. So if you build a house on real estate, you actually are essentially aware of the fact that eminent domain, which is what we would call it, but you can have your property seized at any moment if the party decides that it should, in fact, be seized, or if some land brokers or others are involved with、uh, party affiliations, they create a kind of shadow economy in which they can actually take over your. Real estate and make it used for another purpose. McDonald's had a actually. There's an example of this in、um, about eight years ago. Starbucks had a Starbucks actually in the Forbidden City in Beijing, and it looked just like the rest of the Forbidden City. They did a very good job of keeping the historic quality of it, so it, it looked very much like the rest of the architecture. But within about three years of its opening, the government became very unhappy that. It was、uh, a foreign business inside the foreign inside the Forbidden City. So even though it was empl- employed nothing but Chinese, in the end the government actually removed Starbucks and made service no longer around the Forbidden City. It had to be somewhere else. So they just simply moved them. This gives you an idea of what we're looking at here in terms of the what the economy looks like in China.、Uh, there is a growing middle class. There is, in fact, nouveau riche, which are often found、uh, in. The larger cities, and we have traditional elites,、uh, people who are well educated, who are perhaps in government、uh, positions, and then we have people who are the party elites, like Xi Jinping and others like that. And it is the case that this is a more traditional economy to the left-hand side and a market-driven one to the right. But China has a has economy is actually a command and market economy. So many of us refer to it as market Leninism. It's still. Kind of centralized in a way, but on the other hand, it does encourage a diversity of of,、uh, of economic growth. This shows you what the economic growth has looked like over the number of、uh, years here. This is the statistics that I would identify as being maybe a, a bit problematic.、Uh, you can see the adjustment made here by capital economics, bringing down a couple of notches the、uh, economic growth. But it's actually probably the case that、uh, you can recognize here that we have a declining growth. We now are. The government's official statistic is about, I think, the most recent quarter was about 6.2 percent growth, and that's the government long ago said that if they couldn't keep the the growth of the economy at about 7.2 percent, then it would represent a problem. It would actually be a, a real problem for the government, and so the government is in fact currently in a certain crisis of sorts, which we'll talk more about in a minute, and you can see how in fact. This projected growth rates are have dropped significantly over the number of years. These are the more adjusted rates, the ones that actually reflect, I think, pretty much what has been going on the last number of years. And we can see here that 2019's projection is 6.52. I don't think that's going to be met. It's going to be something below that. And each of these are these real incomes could be a problem as they go down. Uh, outward foreign,、uh, the foreign direct investment by China is growing by the billions. You can see here that by 2016 it was already approaching 200 billion. It is now way beyond that, and the government is currently involved in this Belt and Road Initiative, which is, requires about one to two trillion dollars worth of their own investment. A lot of it will be, as we'll talk about in a short time, very problematic. One of the results of all this growth, of course, is industrial production, and this is what it looks like. In one city in Anhui, which is not that it's a a measure of several hundred miles south of、uh, Beijing and to the east. This is an example. This is actually a little graphic that shows you the contributions and pro- projection of pollution going over、um, from 1990 to 2100. If in fact, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be living to see that, but、uh, it, could, it could be that.、Uh, <laughs> we'll see. It. Anyhow, all right. 
Here's what happens when there's lots of growth. There's also a water problem in China, not just pollution. This is the, believe it or not, this is the Yangtze River. And this is what it looks like sometimes in Chongqing, which is a, a very rapidly developing part of Sichuan province. In fact, it's so rapidly developed that this particular city, Chongqing, is now identified as almost a province unto itself. But you can see here these people are having a picnic on, in the middle of the Yangtze River. Right. So what's going on with this water? Where is it? First of all, you have a declining water table to begin with, especially around Beijing. But the government has been involved in what they identify as being their water, a water movement project in which they're building these conduits of water, as you can see here in red, that are moving water to the north as much as possible because the weight of, uh, of population and demands are made evident by virtue of these colors here. You get a sense that this is a bit of a problem. And if you look at the fact that so much of the western part of China is not especially green, right? Uh, they only have about, you know, 7% of China's land is arable, which is not a lot, right? And there's a lot of desert. All right, here, we're just gonna, for a moment, I'm putting up the Chinese, this is Chinese and American uh, trade war, right? So here's an idea of the, how China and the US are kind of colliding in a way. And it gives us a sense of how the real GDP of China is growing. But I should point out that about um, something in the order of $128 billion of China's GDP is actually in debt. So China has a growing debt problem, as does the United States. In fact, they're both involved in a certain measure of debt investment, or debt growth, you might say. And this debt growth process is something which is uh, going to be increasingly harmful for China, more so than it will be for the United States. I think if, you, if the Federal Reserve adjusts its interest rates, it has more of an effect on the world economy than does, let's say, China right now and its debt problems. But it has big debt problems. All right, this is just an effort here to explain to you that China has a new industrial policy, which is called uh, Made in China 2025. And it's really a, an effort to try to cope with its growing into a world that for the most part has been dominated by European and US economies. And, and in fact, it's now been identified as focused on artificial intelligence, advanced uh, technology, and that includes doing such things as making a 737 equivalent in China that will soon be flying. And maybe it will not be a MAX 8 or 9, I hope, but uh, they are making a plane that uh, will, they believe will be able to replace Boeing's planes so they can actually begin to rely less heavily upon Boeing. And this is a more, another example of this, this national plan turns into a manufacturing superpower. What I didn't understand about that when this was announced is that China is already a manufacturing superpower. So I didn't really understand why the government was making such a big deal about it becoming one. But, and here's another example of how Chinese officials say that these, the targets they've made for this, this program of, of becoming a super manufacturer for the planet are not official targets. And in fact, as you can see down here, they're, they've expected 70 different provinces and cities and counties to actually provide some strategic plans for this made in China. But it's the case that these strategic plans are for the most part more imaginary than they are real. And that represents another problem. That a lot of the reporting that goes on with respect to what the government tries to keep track of is often, if you will, manipulated at lower levels before it even gets to Beijing. So therefore, a lot of this information is often problematic that they're doing their, their uh, forecasting on. All right, so let's just look at, uh, let's, we've actually looked a little bit at the country. We've looked a little bit at, at the different finances uh, that the government and uh, not its households yet, but the government deals, has to deal with. And now I thought we'd look at a few images of China. Every now and then I've put the, I have, I have the traditional characters here as well as the simplified characters. And as you know, the right-hand side with fewer strokes is the simplified character for country. Guo. So Zhong uh, central uh, kingdoms basically is what it means. And so this is China. And 
I think you can recognize that the writing on that wall is not Chinese, right? So, and it's clearly Arabic. So uh, this is another example of that polylinguistic practice I was talking about before. So in real life, China is pretty complicated. So this is in Xinjiang, all right, in the Northwest. But if we go back to this slide, this is, if you will, in Xinjiang. And in fact, it's on the outskirts of Kashgar, which is a, a very important market town and has been for a long time. But this is the capital of Xinjiang. It's a, and this was taken, actually, this photograph was taken in about 2013, I think. So this is six years in. It looks pretty astonishing there. But nonetheless, this is the same province, right? Okay. And here are people praying in that capital. These are men praying in groups. These are uh, Muslims, obviously, but, uh, and some are Uyghur and some are Hui. The Uyghur are, if you will, not easily identified as Chinese by their physiognomy, in large part because this northwestern part of China has traditionally been an area of the convergence of different peoples in the course of the movements in trade and migration over many, many centuries. But this is what prayer looks like outdoors in Urumqi. This is a family cultivating its, uh, its rice fields for the family right here. It's just outside their house, and this is in uh, southern China. This is also part of China. This is a shepherd's hut in Mongolia. It, so just again, another example of what we see as the complication of China. This is a little dark here because of the lights, but these are uh, women and children who are in Xinjiang who are basically completely covered for, uh, according to the most stringent Muslim practice. Of course, this is uh, Chumalongong, which is otherwise known as Mount Everest, where increasing numbers of people are trying to climb and also die at the same time. So that's part of China. Here are monks and nuns that are in Lhasa. They're in Tibet, and they're actually at a new rail station that was built a number of years ago. Lhasa now has good rail system, and that means that China can, the Chinese government can get out to Tibet in a way it never could before. This is Han tourism, Chinese touring the Patala Palace in uh, Tibet. This is a market. This is how a lot of people do their shopping in many cities in China. This is actually in, uh, outside of Urumqi, and here's another kind of consumer shot. This is from Kunming. These are people who actually learned of a uh, store coupon that would be given out for discounts at the uh, in a local department store. So people are like crying out to get one of these coupons. This is an example of all that movement from the countryside to the city I mentioned before. This is a, a photographic project done by an artist who, and it's called the Kong Xinhua Project, which means the empty stool project, meaning it shows you how many members of the family are no longer in the home. And so they're still living in the countryside and there's the grandparents and the son, uh, grandson, sorry. And the parents are off working elsewhere as well as the uncles and aunts and so forth. So this is what it looks like for some people to bring their uh, goods to market or buy goods, uh, buy goods very cheaply and then sell them in markets. This is another example. This is in Yunnan, showing an example of how some people uh, move from the countryside to the city by bringing themselves with the prospect, if you will, of selling goods en with enough success that they can actually get by. This is an example of migrant uh, workers uh, living here in Gansu, and this particular shot was taken in a in a um, alley, but it reflects the the person on the bike and also the two people in front here are migrants that are from the countryside. Oops. And this is a, a house, what's called a nail house, in Shang, outside of Shanghai. All that land around there has been uh, claimed by the government for uh, building. This one is this building has been condemned, but it's flying the Chinese Communist uh, 
flag of the national flag, and actually people are still in that house. And nail houses are called this because they stand up over and against the fact that everything else around them is being cleared for some development, and they're refusing to turn over their house. And the way they do this is by just living in it and not leaving it. And somebody always stays in the house. And if you send an errand out, then you send an errand out, but everybody else is still in the house. It's really, it's, a, it's like a shell game in a way. This just goes to show you, this is actually near the Yangtze Gorges Dam. And this is a big clan named, the, named Zhang, which is a very common last name. And uh, Chinese like Jensen in Denmark, I guess, or Smith might be here. But anyhow, this is a clan gathering, and this is uh, toward the end of the meal. This is a rural village, believe it or not. It's the most celebrated rural village on the planet, that being that it was completely nothing but the kind of cultivation we saw before with a family outside of their home. This is now, if you can see, it's nothing more than, and this is not Photoshop. All these homes are, in fact, identical. Okay. And this is, was all governed by the planning of a, of a village chief who saw it upon took it upon himself to actually make this happen. And this is a tower he built, which, which actually enables you to, it has a restaurant up above there, and it has a view of all the area. But in fact, since the area is pointing out here, often very uh, cloudy, it's not an observation tower that makes much sense. But this is Shanghai. We're really, I think we know a lot about Shanghai. We hear about that all the time. It's the business center of China in many ways. It's not the political center as Beijing is, but that's Shanghai. And so, of course, Shanghai then would suggest that we are living in a world that if we look at this village here, we're seeing a kind of progress here that goes from a Zhang clan to Hua Xi to then something like that. It looks like we're scaling forward with a very a sense of how widely different China is and its different uh, geographic reasons. But more importantly, it shows you just how expansive this vision is of modern urban life. And this is the uh, Pudong region here, just across the river there is, a, is an island that was largely kind of reclaimed and built, by the, built up by the uh, government. And uh, that particular island is sinking a couple of centimeters uh, every day. So just keep that in mind. Um, I mean, one of these days, some parts of this island are going to be very, very curious. But for now, you can see people from the Bund looking over the other side. But to give you an idea of just how, uh, I'd like to show you a little clip here of just how amazing it is that China is leading the world in technology. We often don't realize this, but China, despite all those disparities in growth and also the fact that there is such, such a need still in China to develop, the fact is we have two to 300 million people in China who are now living in absolute poverty. So with that, it realized that we have a developing country here, not a developed country. And yet that particular fact doesn't, doesn't always get digested by us. But I want to just show you what's possible in the way, way of just phone technology in China. And I'll, I'll let you think about what the implications of this could be. This is something which came from the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago. Where's the sound? If you are sitting in... Can you hear it? Is it okay? All right. In the United States or Europe right now, you've probably never used a Chinese app. But the reality is, if you want to know how the internet will develop, China, the land once known for its cheap ripoffs, has actually become a guide to the future. You know, the internet is the internet, but for China, the internet is more like an intranet. It's largely walled off from the Western world by this incredibly complex system of filters and blocks that we call the Great Firewall. And basically, the Great Firewall blocks any foreign site the Communist Party doesn't think it can control. So that means there is no Facebook, no Twitter, no Google. Instead, what filled the internet vacuum was a generation of Chinese copycats that have grown into huge companies. So for Google, you had Baidu. For YouTube, you had Yoku. For Twitter, you had Sina Weibo. And the list goes on and on. It's almost as if the Chinese internet is a lagoon as an aside to the greater ocean of the internet. And in that lagoon, there are these swamp monster apps that bear some resemblance to the creatures in the ocean, but are mutated in some ways because they evolved in a different kind of environment. 
but things have started to shift in the sense that before no one outside of the lagoon really cared about the swamp monsters. But now all of a sudden, some of the features they've developed are so amazing that Western apps are trying to copy them. And the greatest example of this is WeChat. WeChat is an example of, uh, for lack of a better word, a super app. It's a Swiss army knife that basically does everything for you. Now watch this. It's your Same. WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Uber. It's your Amazon, Instagram, Venmo, and Tinder. But it's other things we don't even have apps for. There are hospitals that have built out whole appointment booking systems. There are investment services. There are even heat maps that show how crowded a place is, be it your favorite shopping mall or a popular tourist site. The list of services goes on basically forever. But it's not the variety of things you can do on WeChat that makes it so powerful. It's the fact that they're all in one app. So why does that matter? Hypothetically, imagine you're sitting at home and one day you notice your corgi is dirty. You open WeChat, hit a few buttons, and a few hours later a man shows up at your door with some shampoo and a big vacuum. Your dog gets cleaned and he looks great. You take a photo, you share it with your friends, and tag the dog cleaning business. You haven't left the app. Your friend who likes Hello Kitty and works a boring office job is slacking off at work and looking at WeChat. She sees the photo of your clean corgi. She decides she wants her poodle clean. She clicks the tag on your photo and orders the same service. Within seconds, the man with the big vacuum is on his way to her house. She pays him, and he's happy because he got paid instantly on WeChat. She starts chatting with you to thank you. Neither of you have left the app. While chatting, she tells you about a new hip noodle joint. She says, you have to come. It's a schlep, but you accept. She orders food while still at her desk. You order a taxi. She pays for the food. On the way to her house, the man with the big vacuum invests the money he earned from both of you into a wealth management product that's probably a little too risky. Neither of you nor the man with the big vacuum have left the app. Both of you arrive and the app tells the kitchen you're there. Your WeChat profile photo pops up on the wall. It's an old photo from the year you had that weird part in your hair. Of course she makes a comment. Your food is served. You notice your meat is a bit overcooked, so you snap a photo and post a disparaging restaurant review. You're already on your phone and you remember you still owe your friend money because she paid and transfer her money. Neither of you, the man with the big vacuum, nor the restaurant have left the app. At the restaurant, there are no menus, there are no waiters, there is no cashier. There is only WeChat. No menus. By rolling so many functions into one single app, it's altered the concept of virality. It's no longer just videos or images or tweets that can go viral. It's a dog washer, noodles, all sorts of companies and products that get the push of a social network. Here in China, that network is 700 million people. Sounds great, right? Well, it is, but using a single app to find a date, schedule an oil change, or notarize a document also enables WeChat to collect a staggering volume of personal data. They know what you talk about, who you talk about it with, what you read, where you go, why well, you're going there, right who's here. there, how you spend money when you're online, how you spend money when you're offline. The list goes on indefinitely. For advertisers, this is a miracle. It's the combined data of Facebook, Amazon, Google, and PayPal, all in one place. The problem is, all of the data is information Chinese companies are forced to share with the Chinese government, which has a long record of human rights violations, and isn't exactly shy about stalking its citizens. So if you're not in China, why does this matter? It matters because we're starting to see a number of Western tech companies attempt to replicate super apps like WeChat. For the companies, it's incredibly powerful. And for you and me, it's a convenient and even transformative technology. But of course, it could also be problematic. Concentrating so much data in so few hands could lay the groundwork for an Orwellian world where companies and governments can track every single movement you make. That's it. Okay. So I just thought, thought I'd show you an image of traffic congestion in Beijing at night. So just to give you a sense of what it's like to move not only on the internet, but actually on the streets. One's actually a lot easier than the other. And so I taught a class this, uh, just this past spring uh, here at Notre Dame for students focusing on the, what I looked at in terms of what China is and Asia in general is shaping a, a new order of the world of sorts. And if you look at the back of a dollar bill, you'll see what I had in mind because you'll see this Latin with 
that is below the, the pyramid that has an eye above it, which says, um, basically says, Novos Ordo Silicorum, a new order of the world. Anyhow, I, I suggested that maybe China and Asia in general is bringing about a certain uh, measure of change in the world. And if we think of the world as being much like the circulation within a body, I thought we could call this meridians of mischief, where things are either going sour or going well. And one of the areas of mischief is the South China Sea. As you can see here all the claims that are made by different countries. Uh, Vietnam, Philippines are involved in this. Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, they're all affected by this. Uh, Vietnam has been especially outraged and angry about this effort because the government of China has claimed that that red line there is all of, represents their possession of the areas of the South China Sea. So it overlaps, as you can see, with quite a number of places. And it goes far beyond the 200 uh, nautical miles beyond the shore that would give them any right to claim such things. And that was decided by the International Tribunal in 2016 that they had no right to do this. But China continues to occupy these spaces marked more or less by the red line. And this red line is called the Nine Dash Line. You'll maybe read about that or heard about it. And this is something which goes back to the time which the, there was the civil war between the uh, communists and the nationalists were underway. And the nationalists felt they would inevitably probably have to retreat to Taiwan and began to imagine how they might decide how they could have territories out in the waters of the uh, East China Sea and the South China Sea. And they began to create this kind of map, which has now become part of... Uh, Part, it's actually even marked out on some Chinese passports. And you see here again, more claims. You get a closer sense of why this is a bit of a problem. And many of these islands are not islands. They're just stones and beaches. This is what the Nine Dash Line looks like. And you can see here all the different, these are claimants here that uh, are listed in the boxes where there's the most trouble. And here you can see that navigation through the South China Sea and East China Sea is really one of the principal areas of movement of ships in this region, which is why the United States continues to operate this as a, has these freedom of navigation operations it conducts on a regular basis, in part because China has militarized a great deal of this. And you'll see in a moment what that looks like. And this is what, this is the fiery reef, which is really in the Spratly Islands, which is nothing more than a, was a beach uh, in a bunch of stones that has now been, was made into an actual uh, island with a, with a landing strip and everything else. And I should note that, that they used actual coral. They removed something in the order of 200, I think it was something like yeah, 2,000 square meters worth of coral they pulled out of uh, the Southeast China Sea and actually made these beaches. So in fact, they've actually destroyed a great deal of the ecological environment of that uh, region. Here's what Fiery Cross looks like increasingly, which is, you can see the landing strip there, you can see they made a harbor there, and, and here's, the, yeah, here's the former reef being filled in with sand and coral cuttings. Again, I mean, ecologically, it's, it's a disaster. It's already ruined the fishing of families that have been operating as fishermen for centuries in the Philippines, and they've, fired an, they've actually filed an international suit against China for the destruction of their uh, fishing life. And that's been conducted by uh, Diana De Sierra, who's one of my colleagues here at Notre Dame, who is actually leading this charge to have China pay some compensation, or better yet, acknowledge that they should no longer be developing these things. This is what's actually happening now in Fiery Cross Reef. Uh, China Southern Airlines is bringing tourists to it. They bring tourists there for a certain cost, and you can walk around the island, whatever you, I mean, you can walk around this area, right? Uh, there's not a lot to see, but you can walk around the island, and they take pictures of people smiling and, and um, with flowers being greeted at this island. All right, here's uh, how it is that the web works in China. Uh, the and it indicates that the government here and what's called up here the social credit system, everybody who buys on WeChat and everyone who is, if you will, engaged in activities that are seen as, if you will, either economically or civilianly uh, productive are created, are given a social credit system. Much like you have a credit, uh, you have sort of, you have a credit limit uh, often down to how, you, how high your, or low your score is. It is the case that in China there's a score now for people's uh, social credit. 
but this is an effort to keep track of people. But on, at the same time, when we talk about this repression, it's important to note that Chinese students in Beijing, for example, prefer the US system of governance. Of 505 students, 31.7% learned that there could be a multi-party system and, uh, and elections. They liked it a great deal. 43% somewhat liked it, which is, if you will, quite a number of people. 21% says so, so somewhat disliked it. No one entirely disliked it. Just to give you an idea of the fact that this repression and effort to control the internet and limit, if you will, the opportunities for people to understand what's going on in the world is not uh, that effective. I just put this on here just for the heck of it because uh, I thought, I've never seen this house of cards. I used to call it, I, I used to mistake that in the Game of Thrones thing. I, I used to call this like Game of Cards and, and uh, House of Thrones. I, I didn't really know what it was all about. But anyhow, this is uh, an example of how even programs like this can make their way to China by people going around the internet. I had a student write a senior thesis a couple of years ago that explored how it was the Chinese got around the Great Firewall and were able to actually see American television programs. This is another example of the WeChat. I'm not going to go into this, but uh, this points out in more significantly why it is that all that information that's given to the government by virtue of WeChat becomes a source of autocratic advantage for the government. Here's the new world order I was speaking about. These lines indicate all the different roads and lanes of shipping along the seas that China is now building by virtue of its loans and expansion. Now, this expansion is actually fed by two things. One is the excess labor in China that they no longer really need, though the economy is slowing down. So they're actually shipping out Chinese workers that go along these routes themselves to many of these places. And Pakistan and other such countries, well, Pakistan has, has been upset about this, and so has Burma, that many of the workers, if you will, not local people at all. They're just simply Chinese who are shipped there. So it ends up undermining the prospect of any employment. On the other, the other part of it is that they have lots of surplus now. China's got all kinds of infrastructure surplus they don't know what to do with. And they, they have been building ghost cities for years, but now they're going to ship this stuff out of China and essentially give it away for the most part. And this is how big it gets, right? It goes all the way into France, Germany, Poland. You most recently might be heard that, that Italy has signed up to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's the first time it was really had reached into the investment of China in this road and, and belt initiative had actually reached into Europe. And this gives you another, just another way of looking at how they're building roads, they're building uh, railroad lines, et cetera, all of which is going to be done uh, in the next several years. Here in, uh, here in Djibouti and also in Hambantota, the Chinese government is actually in Gwadar there in just to the, in Pakistan, these are areas that have now been, they've come to be the possession of China for 99 uh, year leases, because in fact, each of these cases, the government was unable to provide any measure of repayment for the loans they were given in the course of this initiative. So they're actually using a sort of colonial system, if you will, which seems odd for a communist uh, country, but a colonial system would basically create a kind of debt slavery in these cities and these ports where, in fact, they can now be taken over by the Chinese. And it, the first military uh, base of any significance has been built uh, at Djibouti, and they're now building one at Gwadar. So, I mean, it just gives you a sense of it. These are all these economic corridors. They're actually literally called this. If you look up the Belt and Road Initiative on the internet, you can get a whole document that explains to you in English what countries have and when have they signed these agreements with China and what, what's been built and what hasn't been built. And all these crazy kind of what looks like word salad here is, is actually for real. These are all quarters that have been established by uh, these, tra these trade initiatives. And this gives you a sense of what's new. I wanted to add this because, in fact, China has been calculating, as have Canadians and Russians and the U.S., how fast the ice has been receding in the Arctic. And one thing that's become increasingly clear is that 
the Arctic is going to be, and in fact, even now, is far more passable than it's ever been before. So in fact, this Belt and Road Initiative now includes the Arctic, what they call the Arctic Road, um, which, again, why roads can be extended through the sea, I have no idea, but that, that's how they're looking at it. So the Arctic is also part of that. This is a suggestion of why it's problematic to develop in this way, in large part because China believes it's creating a certain kind of influence by offering money and infrastructure development. But for the most part, a lot of what they're putting out there are loans that will never be paid back. In fact, some projects they've actually, that have been indicated here as developing in, on the map, or if you will, they've been stopped because in fact, the money ran out and China can't keep paying for it. So that's suggesting that this Belt and Road Initiative, as broad as it is, it's something, if you will, it's the Marshall Plan to the, to the 10th power, or something like that. But in fact, it's hollow. And this is, going to be a, this is going to be an increasing problem for the world economy as it collapses. And then, of course, we know about this, that Xi Jinping has made himself the ruler of life in China. Uh, and what's really funny here for me is that this says the Weida the Lingqiu Xi Jinping Zhu Xi. This means that the the great supreme leader Xi Jinping, Chairman Xi Jinping, Zhu Xi. This is the last two characters were only at, only invented to refer to political operatives in China uh, in 1959 when Mao was actually taken out of any political engagement in the party. They created this vacant job called chairman, and. What I think is funny is that they retired it for a very long time and now it's been brought back, which if you think about it, since it was used as a vacant operative, a sort of noun that referred to nothing more than somebody occupying a position and not doing anything. It is funny they're actually trying to create this now as something which is not just that he's a great leader, but he's also the chairman. Here he is again. This is Beijing. And it's just everywhere you go, you see this guy. Here he is in Xinjiang. He's with all these happy uh, Uyghurs and Hui Muslims who are in Xinjiang. But here's some humor that people actually throw back at uh, Xi Jinping. Yeah, this is, uh, this is called the, this is the real China dream, it's called, with Vladimir Putin holding the umbrella for Obama and Xi, and, uh, or actually Obama doesn't even have it. Included and Abe is down here in the corner. The Prime Minister of Japan is trying to get in the under the umbrella. Uh, more humor. Again, this is humor out of out of China. So it's she forever, and then she forever, and she forever. So basically, he's going to be he's going to be the chairman forever, and he'll be he'll be dead, and he'll still be the chairman. Right? I mean, it's just the fact that people get away with this is amazing. Uh, I so I just I just love showing that. And here is a, this is an image of him looking a little more solemn. And this is actually in Urumqi, that rather massive city we saw before. And this is actually a protest by Uyghurs in the street who are essentially claiming their opposition to the government's internment of Uyghurs. There are now 1.7 million Uyghurs who are in internment camps in Xinjiang. And there are another 1 million people, 1 million uh, Uyghurs who are actually find themselves under a kind of house arrest because the government has now shipped out many, many Han Chinese from the northern parts of China to live as so-called relatives in the homes of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So you actually have to admit them to your home, feed them, and they become part of your family. And yet that's also a kind of house arrest in a fashion. So this is one of the great things that the U.S. has said not enough about. We really ought to be saying more about this, and we haven't. But what is going on here? Here's Xi Jinping as Jesus. I don't mean he's sacrilege here. This is actually, this may well have been a, a joke, but in fact, it's not a joke. Because the Communist Party a few years ago encouraged rural Chinese who are in fact increasingly converting to various forms of Christianity. And there are now probably 22 million Catholics possibly in China. And there are 98 to 100 million Christians. So that means that there are more Christians than there are party members in China. And the government has gotten very concerned about that, so they've actually find, found ways to try to misidentify the volume of Christian conversion that's actually occurred. But nonetheless, you can see here that in Jiangxi, in a county there, 
that was known for its poverty, that they were actually asked to essentially create these kinds of portraits of Xi Jinping as Jesus. So in fact, they could be nationalized. They could be Christianized. They could be Christianized. This is what I, I've called Sino-Christianity or kind of Chinese Christianity, but it's Chinese Christianity governed by the, by the Chinese Communist Party. And it's a really weird thing to think about, but it suggests that you're swapping these posters of Xi Jinping as Jesus. And this idea of essentially trying to nationalize or politicize faith or ethnicity, if you will, is also part of a larger dramatic program that China is engaged in. This is how they're applying this particular experiment of trying to create a political Christianity. They've actually, this is just an example of some of the men who are interned, some of the 1.7 million people who are actually interned in Xinjiang. And this is the, uh, their daily uh, exercise. Uh, the, this is their call before exercise, before they actually go to the grounds where they're allowed to exercise within those fences. And there are 27 confirmed or likely re-education camps now. If you want to learn more about this, I actually have a handout that I think may, many of you may have gotten, but I have a handout that you can pick up on your way out if you want. And it actually has a list of all the different reliable websites you can go to for information on any number of things. And I provide the content on the right-hand side so you know what you can look for. And then I give you the links that you can actually uh, plug in. But this gives you a sense of what's going on. Reuters, by the way, this past fall, provided the most dramatic account ever of what was going on in Xinjiang. Now, the, some UN representatives, no one from the Red Cross, and a few nations, or, the, or let's say officers of some nations, have actually been go, able to go to Xinjiang and see this, these camps. But in fact, they don't really ever see what's actually transpiring. We now know that uh, torture's been going on in, in these camps, uh, and we also, because there's an effort here to re-educate people as Chinese. They want Uyghurs to identify as Chinese, not to call themselves Uyghur, which in fact is what they are, but instead to call themselves Zhongguoren, to call themselves Chinese people. And they want them to become part of a, a national uh, majority, if you will, which is, again, quite an experiment. But it's so far away from the area where we often get our news on the coast, right? We don't really uh, learn about this. So, and I want to note that in the past two months, under, the, under a certain concern the government has that people are finding out more and more about these camps, they've been moving out by the thousands, people from some of these camps, mostly men, by night trains into actual prisons, official prisons of China in the in the uh, north, cent north central region and also along the uh, area of Hunan and uh, Hunan here in the uh, middle of the country. This is what the camps look like from above. This is an aerial photo. There, you can see these block compounds here. And uh, there are women in these compounds too and children and there are playgrounds for children to be on. Okay, so that's that. So what lies ahead for all of us? My guess is that uh, this world order we're talking about, which China is building its, uh, you might say, its popularity around the world, the, China is now seen as a much more re reliable country and a much more, you might even say, um, admired country than the United States. That's happened basically since 2016. We've had three years of this, and now the U.S. has fallen behind China as one of the first countries someone would announce as a as, uh, and as admirable. Yeah, oh, sorry. So here I'm just showing you that these areas that are mapped in colors here show you the collected organizations of countries that are, if you will, part of trade and, um, and political representation of these different regions. And we're going to look at something like this. We're going to have these blocks of of regions that become part of a global economy, but in fact, China is going to be a very important part of that, in large part because most of Africa now is indebted to China. And this shows you by 2050 how Europe's share of the world economy is going to fall, and the same thing is true of the United States. It gives you a sense of it. It indicates how Brazil and Mexico will be larger. Uh, the U.S.'s lar largest trading partner was China as of um, 72 hours ago, but now Mexico is its leading trading partner. And as India, I mean, India is also larger than China now, and it's also growing more rapidly than China ever did. 
Okay, here's we move toward the end. This is uh, Chairman Mao with all the party behind them. And you can see all the citizens of China down below. Uh, and this is, was d done by a Chinese person in 2011. Uh, an artist did this. And it's the Titanic, but it's saying here that <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's saying that, uh, that, w that the helmsman is taking Take, is going out into the great sea. So therefore, you know, it's sort of the effect of it is like, with him in command, we are at ease. And they're all waving goodbye to the Titanic, which they can't wait for it to go down, right? So uh, that's it.